I, I come to this together because I'm always asked, you know, how do you, how can you tell a plan is? Somebody will bring me something to identify, and I'll identify it or not identify it sometimes. And uh, but they'll ask me, you know, what are you looking at? What are, what are you seeing uh, when you identify a plan? Um, and so we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through and look at some some fairly common plants, uh, some native plants you might see in the woods, some um, uh, plants that are pretty common in landscapes, and talk about how to identify those plants. And mostly we're going to be talking about how to identify them to the, the genus, like maple, acer, or, or um, you know, ash, fraxinus, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're, we're, we're just going to, we're not actually going to range too far today. We're going to go around the parking lot and look at some of these plants and out a little bit in, into the arboretum. But as we're walking, um, if you see something and you want to know, you know, how would you identify it if it didn't have uh, the nice label on it, um, feel free to stop me. This is real informal. That's why I didn't do a, a handout. Um, you, you can just stop me then. Or if there's something that, that has troubled you in identifying, you can ask me about it and we'll go, we'll track one down in the Arboretum and, and uh, look at it and talk about some of the features. So I'm going to go through with each plant, look at how I identify it, uh, how I look at it, especially during the winter because it gets tough when you don't have leaves on the plants. So we're going to hit a couple of evergreens that, that really uh, often confuse people, but mostly we're going to look at deciduous plants and, and how we would identify them. Um, I didn't do any kinds when I've, I've taught this uh, as a, a graduate student when I was in college and I taught it, uh, taught plan ID um, at a community college in Virginia. Um, and, and really, when you're teaching plan ID in the mountains of Virginia, you, uh, you spend a lot of time doing winter ID. And really, we, this could be a, you know, a semester long college class, how to identify plants. So I'm really kind of whittle this down to, to some real, some, some things to look at that will help you. And it should help you if you have something you can't identify and you have some books that might help you. We can show you some things to look at that can help you, you know, kind of match things up in the book. A lot of the, the common field guides, how they, how they have things arranged for winter ID. So any questions before we get started? Okay, and if we talk about a plant that you know how to identify, um, and, and I don't mention some feature that you really look at, uh, you know, bring it up, uh, or if, if something I say confuses you, uh, bring it up. I'll, I'll try to um, to be uh, not be real technical with terms that I use what, what we're looking at, or at least uh, uh, explain them more fully. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and hit our, our first tree out here in the, the brick circle, and they were nice enough to move all these the white trucks out of our way so uh, we won't get run down while we're out here. The first plant is, is a real common one uh, in, in our landscapes in, in the wild around here. It's, it's a sweet gum, liquid ambar, uh, styracifluid, one of our, our real common plants. Now if it has gum balls, this has a couple up there, pretty easy to identify. If it has leaves, it's, it's really easy because there's nothing else that looks, looks much like that. But when you see it during the winter, uh, you know, there can be a lot to it to, to identify. And, and this is always a, a challenge for me, telling people how I identify plants, because um, any of y'all who are good gardeners know that some plants you just look at and you can look at them from you know, 20 yards away and you know what it is. They just have that feel. You know, dogwoods give off a certain feel to me. I, I can, you know, they're easy to identify. Um, some are more difficult. Um, sweet gums. Uh, sweet gums are, they're, there's a lot of variation in the wild. If you look at a lot of sweet gums, you'll see a lot of different things with it. But uh, some of the, the real um, uh, things you'll see all the time, young stems, the, the youngest stems uh, tend to be kind of a, a greenish tan, uh, light brown, uh, with, with a light brown, little greenish tinge, and a lot of lenticels, the first technical term, which I said I wouldn't use. Lenticels <laughs> are little uh, marks on the stems, like little, um, you can scales. pass those around. They look like little scales, yeah. Um, they're not scales. Sometimes people ask me what to do about the scale on their plants, and they're really talking about lenticels. Um, there's some debate over what their, their real function is uh, with, um, in plants. There seems to be mostly general acceptance. They have something to do with, with oxygen exchange uh, or, or gas exchange, although there's some debate about how much they really do that and whether they're um, you know, some kind of a uh, kind of relic um, function that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work anymore. Um, so that's, that's kind of some general. What's, what's really obvious on, on sweet gums are these big 
glossy scaled buds. I mean, they are big and, and they are shiny and, and pointy. Um, and the shape of buds really important. They also tend to be, and, and the other one showed this even more, but, but the buds down the stems tend to be stalked. You see that the buds are on little, little stalked. That's, that's a real uh, important ID feature. Um, they're alternate. Some leaves are opposite, some are alternate. We're gonna look at both today. Um, so, so those are some of the, the real easy ID features. If you go back into older growth, um, they will often have these little spur-like growths, which are just real compressed stems. So it'll be kind of like a, the, the bud sitting on a real long stalk. But if you look at it, you can see the bud, the leaf star, and that's another term. The leaf star is just below the leaf. You look at that or you look at this one, you can see it kind of a little, uh, 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 kind of a U-shaped um, mm -hmm. uh, feature right below the bud. And different plants, if you get good, you can really identify plants by, by these leaf scars, bud scars, um, in a lot of cases. This one, if you look at, it'll have three little circles in there. That's where the, the vascular system, the, the circulatory system of the plant, if you will, um, goes out onto the leaf. It's where it transports the waters and the sugars um, to the leaf and the photosynthates um, come back in. Um, often if you see, if you look at uh, uh, sweet gum, liquid ambar, in the wild, uh, you'll see quirky ridges, especially on young plants and young growth. It has these kind of uh, uh, ridges along there. Not on all of them. Uh, on this form, which obviously is not your typical form, um, you don't really see that much. Uh, but, but you can see that sometimes on, on um, young plants. Um, generally, the, the, with this one, the, the key feature is those buds, those shiny, um, scaled, uh, uh, real pointy, uh, large buds and, and on stalks on one side. Questions or thoughts or comments? What does the liquid ambar mean? I couldn't remember. Uh-oh. I don't know. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Are leaf stars always that crescent shaped? Or are leaf stars always that crescent shaped? No. Okay. They, typically they are. If you look at the base of a leaf, usually they're kind of U-shaped. That's that's really um, a structural thing, gives some support there. But they're, they'll be different. We'll look at them on different ones. Some plants, they're, they're hard to see and you don't look at them as much. Some, they're really, really distinct. And the, the, the bud arrangement with that leaf scar um, is different. Sometimes it's it's nestled right in there. Sometimes it's much above there. Sometimes the leaf scar is flat across the top. And, and different plants, it's, it's different. And they really can help you identify plants. And if you look at a key that just has twigs in there, and there are some winter key I, um, you know, books with, with winter um, just twigs, that's one of the things you really look at is they, are those leaf scars. And we'll look at them uh, as, as we go along. This is, a, this is another one as we go by, you can kind of look at it here. This is the same thing, another liquid ambar, but you'll notice some of the buds, sometimes this is where people get confused. They say, okay, I know they've got these, um, these buds that are, uh, are supposed to be pointy, but this isn't pointy. All this is is we had some, some cold weather uh, early on. You know, remember we had a, a week or two of uh, cold weather and then warm weather after that up until now, and some of these terminal buds have started to flower. So that's what you're seeing there. Whenever you're identifying a plant, you never look at one piece. I'm cutting off kind of a, a, a piece that will illustrate what I'm doing. But whenever you're identifying a plant, um, you know, a, a whole plant, you want to look at multiple parts to make sure you're seeing, you know, you're, you're not seeing some kind of aberrant growth because plants can look different in one, you know, a shady section compared to a, a, a part and, and more sun. Um, when you work here, you don't get that luxury. People often bring you a leaf. If you ever bring me something to idea, please bring me at least a twig of it. Even if it has leaves on it, bring, bring a, a, a little piece of it. That, that's helpful. Got it, Joy. Okay, the next one is our Liriodendron tulipifera. So, um, tulip tree, yellow poplar, um, tulip poplar, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Tulip tree is what we have. Um, this is another one of our common native trees. Um, this is actually uh, related to magnolias, believe it or not, and we'll look at another magnolia um, later on, um, and, and you'll see some similarities between them. Uh, the the Liridendron, one of the, the, there are 
couple things I look at. The buds are very distinct on it. Again, this is one where you really look at the buds, like many of these will look at. The, the terminal buds tend to be big, fat um, buds, often with a little bit um, kind of a, if you, if you look at them carefully, you'll see one seam across there. It's two uh, scales covering the entire bud. Uh, and they're kind of flattened uh, often on there. Um, I've heard them described as kind of like uh, duck beaks, something, something like that. I don't know. You have to have a pretty vivid imagination for that. Um, the young twigs, if you look, uh, compare the old growth to the young growth, are, are kind of a, uh, you know, they're, they're a light brown, but there's a waxy coating to them that almost gives them a purplish cast. And you can see that on there. And if you scrape it, you can actually scrape some of that wax off of the branch. Another pretty distinctive uh, feature. The leaf scales are, um, as opposed to that kind of U-shape we had on the, the um, uh, liquid ambar, they're almost round, a little bit flattened at the top, but almost round. And if you look at them real carefully, and it's often helpful to have a 10x uh, magnifying glass, you can see uh, a kind of a ring of, of smaller uh, vascular bundles with a larger one in the center. Um, some of the smaller buds have a little, have a kind of a rounded uh, uh, bud around there, but it also has some stalk buds, some larger stalk buds that, that um, stick out a little farther. Um, if it has fruit, that's, you know, a helpful way to identify it. Uh, the, the buds are composed of these little seeds, these winged seeds, and even if all the seeds fall off, often you'll be left with just this little, uh, little spike on, on the end. Uh, that, that's pretty easy to help identify. Another key feature with this, going back to the, the buds and the, um, the leaf scar, is there is a ring all the way around. Where, everywhere there's a leaf scar, you'll see a, a ring all the way around the stem. You didn't see that on the, the um, liquid ambar. It, you just had the leaf scale and the bud. But this, everywhere you have that bud, there's a ring all the way around that stem. Um, they're often one of the tallest trees around if you have a full tree. Um, the bark on it, I didn't really talk about the liquid ambar bark because I don't think it's very distinctive. Um, the, the yellow poplar will often have these, these very, um, be ridged uh, vertically pretty well. Nice light gray as it gets older, that can be even more distinctive. Um, you know, the, the form, some trees, the form really gives them away. This one, I don't think it does quite so much. Uh, but those leaf scars, that waxy coating, and then, of course, those, those big uh, buds, real, all very distinct. Questions or thoughts on this? All right. Cardinals love the seeds. Is that right? I did not know birds ate the seeds. Either. Cardinals love the seeds. These with uh, yeah, I was just um, somebody's office, and they had a uh, here, and they had a tulip poplar honey um, on their uh, on their desk. Okay, this one I'm not going to cut a bunch of branches off of. So after we talk about it, you can swing by here and look at it. And we're going to look at multiples of this type of plant. Okay, this is a buckeye uh, esculus. This particular one is esculus chinensis, but what I'm going to say uh, pertains to most, um, most all esculus or, or buckeyes or horse chestnuts. And we'll look at another one. We'll look at one of our native ones um, in, in just a minute. Um, one of the first things you'll notice uh, about a buckeye, if, if you look at it like I do when I'm trying to identify a plant, is they often have these great big buds, huge buds on the terminals. Big ones on the, the, the laterals, but, but on the terminal, Great big huge buds. Um, often they're sticky. This one's not too sticky, but often the terminal buds on, on a horse chestnut or buckeye will be real sticky. The next thing you notice, and this is this is in any twig that I look at, leaves, no leaves, one of the, the next thing I always look at is are the leaves opposite or alternate? Most plants they're gonna be alternate, meaning there's you have one and then you know, one on this side, then another one on this side, then another one on this side, then another one on this side. With buckeyes, they're opposite. In the landscape, uh, you know, what the, the acronym we used to tell people is remember mad buck. Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeyes. They're, 
always opposite, except for the few select, you know, few exceptions of dog loading, which are, but they're opposite. So if it's if you have opposite leaves on the stem, and you can see that by the leaf scars, um, you know it's not going to be an oak. You know it's not going to be a liriodendron. You know it's not going to be a, a liquid amber because those are all altered. So you really, you narrow down the number of plants when you have opposite leaves, especially when you're talking about trees. There are more shrubs that are that way, but fewer trees. Now the next thing with, with um, buckeyes beyond the, the big stems and the, um, I mean the big buds and, and a terminal bud, uh, that's key, they always have, have big terminal buds, um, and, and the opposite branching. Uh, you do have a leaf scar connecting the buds on both sides, not a leaf scar, but a, um, well, yeah, leaf scar. It goes all the way around. You have the big uh, leaf scar right here, and then it, it circles around, kind of like on the tulip poplar, but in this case, it just goes over to the other leaf scar. Uh, the leaf scars are large. You know, if you know the, the leaves of buckeyes, they're pretty big, and they have a big uh, base to the leaf. That's how you get this big leaf scar. And they're at each, they're kind of roughly triangular shaped, sometimes shield shaped. Um, you'll have uh, three, uh, bundles of, of two um, uh, vascular bundles. Um, another thing to look for is they tend to, to grow pretty quickly. That The reason this bud is so big is all the growth for the next year is held in that bud. Some plants, they sprout from the bud and then they'll sprout, they'll, they'll form new growth and keep growing. In a Buckeye's case, all the growth for the next year and the flowers are in that bud. And so it really just elongates once. So if you look at, say, something like this, this is what it grew last year, from here to here. Big, big growth on that. Um, it came here, the terminal bud was right here last year. So it, it shot out and it was more or less a stick to get all this um, really vigorous growth. Um, the buds sit well up above the, that leaf scar. They're not, it's not a U-shaped on top, so they don't sit down in there, they sit well above it. Um, but in general, the tree types are very easy to identify. We'll look at our shrub year bottle brush buckeye as well, and that's that's a little different, but you'll see the, the similarities. Questions about buckeye? Yes? Is that terminal bud takes all growth potential for next year? The deer comes along and eats the bud off. Will that branch not grow this year? Well, you've got right here beside it, and right here, you have more buds, and they'll both grow but one will tend to outgrow the other. So you take this off and all, you know, it's still, the roots are still pushing up water and, and pushing that growth out. And that'll push these out. There's something with these plants that have all their growth and, and pines are like this. Pines, all their growth is, is in that bud, that terminal bud uh, going into winter. Um, so there's two things going into the growth. If you have a really good year of growth, uh, you know, and, and going into the late summer, fall, when they're forming that terminal bud, if you have all the right conditions, you know, nice sunny days, plenty of moisture, you got to pack a lot of cells in that bud. The, the number of cells is greater in that bud to get ready to go. Now, when those are elongating, mostly in the spring and early summer, if we have really good weather, good conditions, fertility, water, you know, sun, it's sunny, all those kind of conditions, those cells will elongate farther. They'll, the cells themselves will get bigger. Now, if you have bad conditions when they're elongating, they'll be smaller and more compact. So, you know, even though all the, the so the, the growth each year depends on two things. It depends on the conditions when the buds are forming and the conditions when the buds are elongating. But if you take off this, um, you know, say, say a deer comes along and nibbles it down to here, all the water and everything that's pushing this terminal bud, that's just going to push these buds. And so these will both go out. One will outgrow the other, typically, um, generally the one that's more vertical. And, and so you'll, that'll become kind of that, that um, leader, and you'll, you'll form a big bud at the end of that at the end of the season. So you will still go up, but you will get more branching. Did that confuse the heck out of everybody? Okay. But is that a sprout mark of what, you know, the other Yes, we, other we lost the, the, the main tree, and this is a bud, um, uh, you know, a, a, a shoot from the base. 
I'm not entirely sure. I think this was a grafted plant, so I'm not sure that, that this is actually this. We're waiting. I'm hoping we'll get some flowers this year and be able to tell if it is Eskils chinensis or not. Yes. What are, what, what is this? Crepus. Which? Crepus. Crepus. A little, uh, you know. Pink thing. Creeper. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a pink nice. dandelion. <laughs> That's what the, the uh, flower or the uh, seeds look like. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is. Looks like you can have dandelions. Pink's nice. Um, it's better in front. I, I've chosen to oh, start this with some unusual <laughs> forms of some common plants, like the um, the fastigit, uh, uh, uh sweet gum, and uh, and then this one, a little dwarf uh, compact ginkgo. And I did this to show that, that the things you're using to identify a big tree can be used to identify it even when it's in a a strange shape or form. Um, ginkgos are another one of those that, that if you're around plants much get to be very easy to identify. Um, they are alternate leaved uh, like the liquid amber so they're not that opposite. Um, the, the young stems tend to be fairly stout and uh, this nice smooth gray. Uh, with age you get some more character to the bark but when they're young really nice uh, smooth gray. Um, the, the flowers grow on spurs and I mentioned spurs before and you can see them a little bit better here. These, they're these little short little uh, branches. You see that with um, apple trees do that, pear trees uh, do that. And um, what those are, those are just really compressed stems and and so what you're seeing on those, they're kind of, they're always, the spurs are always kind of rigid and that's because they've got all the leaf scars from every, you know, every year the growth keeps coming out there. So you'll keep getting leaves everywhere you have these, these little spurs. Now other plants I mentioned have spurs, so how do you tell these apart? Well, the buds are kind of these rounded, um, hemispherical shaped buds with um, scales on there. And one of the ways that I, you know, it's hard to, to confuse this with other things when you know what the buds look like. But one way to make sure is the outermost scales don't go up and cover it like, like on, um, say, the, the sweet gum where you had those scales that came up to a point. The, the, the outermost scales only get halfway up it and then kind of stick out a little bit. So they're kind of rough looking when you look at them up close. And y'all are welcome to come up close. That's another one I didn't want to want to cut on. Um, between those, those spurs and those rounded buds, generally pretty easy to identify. Um, the bark's very smooth, and sometimes, I was doing it here, I, I didn't see this earlier, the, the coating on there will kind of peel off, and it's this kind of thin papery, parchment papery look, and, it, and you get that a lot on the youngest twigs when you go into winter. The questions? Am I getting y'all what y'all want, or? Mm -hmm. Is this what y'all were thinking when y'all were coming, or is there something else I can do to... This is the first time I've given a tour like this, so it's unusual for me. All right, well, if there are no questions, I'm moving on. And you'll show us a larger ginkgo later, right? Yeah, I can show you a larger yeah. ginkgo. Okay, this is the next one. And this is the, the European beech. Uh, much of what I'm going to tell you is can be applied to our, our native beach also. There are some differences, but um, what you'll see in landscapes is typically the European beach, Vegas sylvatica. Very distinctive plant. Now again, this is a fastigit form, but it could be uh, your typical broad spreading form or one of the weeping purple leaf forms or any number of there's, you know, dozens of, of different selections of this. Um, I'm going to give you all a couple of branches. Y'all can Pass them around. You want to get a shot and then pass it around. Um, can anybody tell me what, what, anybody who's looked at it, what the most distinctive feature of this is? What would be your first clue in identifying it? There's hairiness along yeah. the stems. Well, there's some hairiness where, where the kind of the, <laughs> the branch peels off. And the youngest branches on these are covered in, in uh, this, this real fine um, hair, indumentum, um, and then they lose that through the winter. So by the next spring, most of that hair will be gone. It's starting to peel off now. I think the shape of the, uh, 
from the buds. They're yeah, here. that's so that funny. elliptical shape. Yeah, that's how I identify it. And this is true of, of both our native Vegas grandifolia and the Vegas vatica. Is you have these long, cylindric, sharply pointed buds, and um, they they tend to be on. You just have those big buds on the terminals and uh, some side branches, especially on the outside out, outermost growth, and then on some kind of spur like. Uh, uh, growth on the side, so they're they're not exactly stalked, but they give that appearance of being stalked a little bit. Uh, twigs are thin on Vegas. You have you know you saw the really stout stems on um, you know the Esculus and, and the uh, uh, the tulip poplar on, on Vegas. They tend to be thin, and overall, if you look at it from a distance, even you know whether it's upright or out, you tend to have see a lot of this kind of fine. Uh, twigginess um, to them. Uh, the the stem color can be different depending on the selection. There's some, some gold leaf selections that it tends to be more of a yellowy green. Some purple leaf selections where it tends to be a little bit darker purple. So I don't go from that that color much. It is um, it is opposite leaved. Uh, it's hard to see that a lot because um, but if you look at some of these shorter branches, you can see some smaller buds on there and uh, uh, where they're, they're opposite, I mean alternate from each other. Did I say opposite? Before? Yeah, you did. I'm sorry, yeah, alternate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, it wasn't a mad buck. No, it was not a mad buck. <laughs> um, but those buds are going to be your biggest, biggest clue. On those, and there's... Yeah. If you don't have leaves to look at. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Thoughts? What was the species? Uh, this is Fagus sylvatica. What's the one that's like more native to North Carolina? Is that also sylvatica? No, the one that's native to North Carolina is Fagus grandifolia. Oh. But most of what I said could be um, could be applied to Fagus grandifolia. Grandifolia will tend to have a little bit more gray bark. Um, the um, the buds are generally longer, but very similar. Uh, they'll be, you know, another uh, another half inch, three quarter inch longer than those, um, and, and a little bit plumper, but still that long and skinny. Um, but that's the real big difference between the two when you when you're looking at them without leaves on them is, is kind of the gray bark and that those longer buds. But this one here, do they? This particular one grows up like that? This, this, this selection grows up. Fagus sylvatica in the wild grows out. This is one called Rohan Minaret, I think. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Rohan Minaret. So speaking of leaves, most beech hold a bunch of leaves all winter. Is that typical for the season? That is, the leaves, holding the leaves um, for the season, it, it is very typical for young plants. As they become more mature, they will tend to drop their leaves earlier in the winter. But it's it's something in the the whole family, the Fagus family. A lot of the plants that includes oaks. See this oak right here. Especially when they're young, tend to hold their leaves. They don't form the abscisic acid, which abscises the leaves and makes the leaves drop off. They hold them. Um, a lot of the oaks are from uh, very cold climates, and the, the leaves may help protect them a little. Help buds keep stay protected so they don't get blasted by cold. Um, but I've heard a, several different theories, and I don't know that anybody knows really why they do that, but it is typical of the of the genus, I mean, of the family. And it is certainly with Fagus uh, sylvatica, which can help with identification a lot of times with trees. You'll have some of these, you know, leaves hanging on in there, you know, even in January and February. Okay, this one is perhaps not as common here as it is in some other areas, but it's, it's a linden, Tilia cordata. Um, this happens to be a, a dwarf one. They can, they're kind of really nice medium-sized shade trees, but lindens, tilia, um, or in England, lime trees. They, they call them lime trees, and they don't mean the citrus. Um, again, not used widely here, although they should be grown more widely. They're, they're really nice urban-tolerant uh, trees. Uh, again, alternate uh, leaves on there, not a mad buck. Um, the, the youngest stems and the 
Um, next old, and even going back several years, tends to be fairly smooth. You really have to go back three or four years of growth uh, to start getting this um, little rougher, rougher bark. Um, the buds on it are not pressed up against the stem. The buds are sometimes pressed up against the stem, sometimes they, they, they're more divergent. In this case, they tend to be fairly divergent, but rounded. They're not sharp pointed. They're really nice um, ovoid buds with a, with a nice rounded top. Um, terminal buds, a little bit larger. That's, that's often typical uh, in these plants. Um, some lindens you can get a lot of the lenticels. This one not so much, but in some you can. Um, the the leaf scar. I didn't really talk about leaf scar in the other plant, last plants, because uh, it's not real distinctive. And again, on this one, it's not a terribly distinctive feature. Um, after looking at lots of lindens, it's some. It often looks to me like the leaf scar is almost split, and the bud is is right in the middle and there's leaf scar on either side. It's not really there. It does go all the way around, but it kind of gives that impression uh, if you look at it. Um, if it has fruit, it's an easy way to identify it. And the fruit hang on for a long time, often through most of the winter. Uh, the fruit consists of this little leafy bract and then uh, the little fruit hangs down and you have the, the seed inside, inside the fruit. Um, and so you can see that uh, kind of all over this tree. It looks like it's holding on to leaves, but those are actually the, the old uh, flowers uh, and the fruit now. Not the easiest tree to identify, but those rounded divergent buds are, are what give this one away. Is that one native to North Carolina? Uh, not, not Tilia cordata. That's native to, to Europe, um, I think. Yeah, there you go. Native Europe to Siberia. I love these labels. Um, <laughs> we do have native uh, tilia um, basewood, tilia americana, which is a, a taller tree, great leaves, similar in a lot of aspects, but much coarser. Um, bigger branches, bigger leaves. Um, the whole thing. Other questions? Why do you say should be planted a lot? Because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it no, it's. Um, it does have some issues with our heat. It's perhaps not the most heat tolerant tree, but it's it's a nice size. It's medium size, so it's it's not you know a big oak or maple. Although it can get large with dirt, you know, you know a long, long time. But it's kind of more. I think of it more in that 35 to 45 foot range. So bigger than a dogwood, smaller than a, than a white oak. Um, the flowers are are not real showy but they're they're fragrant it's got a really nice fragrance to the flowers bees love the flowers which is good anything we plant that the bees like i think is helpful um you know this is a dwarf one but they tend to have tilia cordata and, and some of the closely related ones like tilia tomentosa tend to have this really nice evenly shaped head without anybody touching it even on a large you know imagine this just larger and that's pretty nice uh, so that's why I think it, it should be more widely planted. You know, you get the tours, you get, you get a platform to throw your opinions out there, right? All right. Next one is a witch hazel, which is, fits in flowers pretty darn easy to identify during the winter. Um, <laughs> Aurora is about the earliest one, so uh, we'll pretend that it doesn't actually have flowers and see how to identify it without the flowers. Um, but we'll also talk about the flowers a little bit as well. <coughs> Um, witch hazels. First, form. Uh, witch hazels, this is one that I, I will talk about form a little bit more. Tend to be kind of widespreading. They're, uh, they, they can't decide whether they want to be a shrub or a tree often, but they'll often be kind of spreading out wide. Um, that's, that's pretty distinctive on them. Um, the flower buds on there, great feature to identify uh, witch hazels over the, the winter because because most of them don't open up until much later in the season, so the flower buds are there. And you'll get these kind of little fuzzy stalk clusters of, of buds um, towards the interior of the plant, typically. The, the newest growth won't have that. So, so they, these are all gonna be flower buds, these little fuzzy buds. Now it does have, the terminal buds will be relatively large and very um, felted with this kind of uh, grayish yellow um, felting. And um, there are several plants that do that. The terminal bud won't be right at the tip, uh, like you see on the, the buckeye, but it's kind of offset. So the branch kind of ends and the bud 
comes over to the side a little bit like that. But they'll be kind of, and they can range from being, you know, nice and long like this to being a little more squat. Um, but, but they'll tend towards more towards this on the terminal. The buds at the leaf stars are much smaller. In fact, they're almost, they're, they're really difficult to see. But there are buds there. Um, the leaf scar is uh, kind of ovoid with a little bit of a flattish top. And it and it's kind of has concentric rings in it. Uh, this one, um, if you just have a, a, a somebody gives you a branch without those flower buds and the, the terminal bud, that kind of a uh, kind of squashed bullseye of the uh, buds, uh, leaf bud is is one way to identify it. Um, that'd be one of those where I'd tentatively identify it. I don't know that I would I would stake my life on on identifying it just by that that uh, leaf scar, but but it is it is fairly distinctive. The newest growth on the buds, as well as the as newest growth on the branches, tends to have be a little fuzzy. You know, it's not that smooth, glossy we saw in uh, some of the other ones. Uh, it is, it is again alternate. Um, so, relatively easy, especially if you have these winter buds. And then, of course, if they open, you have these uh, strappy petals, and witch hazels can be um, yellows to kind of reds and oranges, those those, those type of colors. And it is nicely fragrant too a great um, great winter plant for that that interest uh, trying to decipher between the species of witch hazel is can be very very difficult um, so we won't we won't get into that a lot of times you have to you, you know leaves you can tell some but even then it's it's kind of difficult um, we do have native witch hazels um, uh, Hamamalis virginiana, uh, which flowers in, in the fall, and Hamamalis vernalis, which flowers in the, the spring. All the ID characteristics are fairly similar, similar, even though this is a hybrid between uh, two Asian species, but still fairly similar in terms of, um, of ID characteristics. What, what's the name of the spring? Hamamalis vernalis. Vernalis. Vernalis, yeah. Um, and the, our natives. Uh, are not quite as showy. The, the strappy petals aren't aren't nearly as long, so it's it's not near not quite as showy as, as some of these Asian ones and Asian hybrids. But there are some really nice forms of the native ones. Other questions? They like more shade than sun. Um, they're very shade tolerant, but if they have adequate moisture, you'll you'll get better growth and more flowers in in more sun. Yeah, you know, this one gets pretty good sun. For a pretty good chunk of the day during the summer um, right through here even when the leaves are on the trees uh, so it's it's gets shade but uh, from the hottest afternoon Sun but it gets a fair amount of Sun and it really it really appreciates that you can tell that by the number of flower buds it, it forms it's, it's a pretty happy one but you can also see it's reaching a little bit you know this way that side is, is pretty well shaded by the oak now ashes aren't quite so prevalent here as they are up farther north and uh, you know the the way the the doomsday prophets are talking. Well, uh, all the ashes will be gone once the emerald ash borer moves through. Our ashes will actually probably be spared because we have fewer ashes down here, so there won't be the um, they won't be able to move from tree to tree as easily down here and it's farther south. But but we do have some ashes. This is a Japanese one. We do have some native ones here, um, and ashes are. Uh, they can look very different when you look at their buds uh, in terms of size. Uh, we have another, what we call another flowering ash, uh, Fraxinus ornus, uh, that has huge buds, almost like that buckeye. But the thing that, that both this smaller ash and this the larger one have in common is, well, they're, they're a couple things. I don't want to take, really don't want to cut off too many of these terminals. So I'll, I'll pass this around afterwards. Um, but you get, you have a terminal bud, but you have these two auxiliary, auxiliary buds right at the same, all the way up there. It's not just below it. In the Aeschylus, we had the terminal bud and there were other buds beside it. But if you looked closely, you could see there was stem growth in between them. They weren't together. Whereas this is, this is all terminal, these three part terminal um, buds. Um, and then as you go down, the buds are opposite because you have opposite leaves on your plants. Um, we're a mad buck. This is maple ash, dogwood, and buckeye. This is Fraxinus's ash, so you get that mad buck. So 
looking at it, if I were to walk by this very quickly, I may mistake it for a dogwood, mm -hmm. maple ash dogwood. Um, you get that same type of branching, and that's because you have opposite buds. And so you get that tend to have branching where you have two going out and one going up. Very distinctive in dogwoods. Many of the ashes have stouter branches, so you don't confuse them. I wanted to show this one because it is a little smaller, more like a dogwood. But when you look at it closely, there are some pretty significant differences. Uh, relatively large buds. This is one with small buds. So you can imagine, if you look at this, these are pretty good size. The ones with larger buds, very large. Pointy, you have pointy buds, and that's typical on, on most ashes. Um, the, uh, and, and just two, um, two scales on the buds. You saw some of the other buds, like the, the Fagus, that had a lot of scales on that long, skinny bud, whereas this just has two that close over, kind of like the, the Liriodendron. And that's real typical of, of um, ashes, fraxinus. Um, now, I want to show you, uh, I don't know if you can see this, um, and I don't want to cut this off for the shape, sake of the plant, but sometimes on, on ashes and other plants with opposite leaves, you'll get a few that are sub-opposite. They don't quite line up, and that's just because, you know, plants are, are not perfect. But if you look around at the whole thing, everywhere else you see these opposite buds. Um, a couple other things, so you don't get confused between this and other plants with opposite buds. Where the, the, the buds are, it swells right there, so the stem gets larger right there where those two buds are. Um, the, the leaf scars on Fraxinus can be very different. Um, this is probably not an ash you're going to run into a whole lot, um, you know, but so you can't really go by the leaf scars. It's actually, there are two natives, and, and we don't have good examples of them here to show you. The, um, the green and white ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica and Fraxinus uh, americana. Is that right? Back when I was in colder <laughs> areas, I knew those. That's really how you tell them, tell them apart is by their leaf scars and how their leaves are held. And one, the, the bud is up above the leaf scar and one it's down below and I can't remember which one is which. This is the one thing I really struggled with in plant ID when I was taking it was the green and white ashes. Um, that's an aside there. But typically have the smooth bark, the, the two scaled um, buds, three on top, opposite. Questions? Oh yeah. Pass this around on. So, and you know where you get the stoutest branches, you're gonna have the biggest buds. We go through little skinny branches, you'll have the smallest, but but same thing just in miniature. Okay. I wanted to stop and look at this just uh, real quickly. I said I would. There's some differences um, in the buckeyes. This is one of our native ones. Uh, this is the shrubier one, Esculus parviflora, the bottle brush buckeye. Um, and uh, just take off a few parts to show you some, some differences. This is a little different than the other buckeyes and how it grows. Where it's spreading out like this, which you'll often get on the side branches of, of more tree type buckeyes, you often won't get that big fat terminal bud. What you'll get is two buds that are opposite and the one that's on the, the top side of the branch usually is a little bit bigger, but you don't get that central one. Reason you get, that is on the buckeye is because where that central uh, growth bud would be, you had a flower, and you can see that's what this is, is the old flower stalk. So it doesn't form that terminal bud. But in other respects, it's the same. You get those opposite leaf arrangement, uh, where you had the leaves, you had those big bud scars with the three vascular bundles in there. Um, you know, so it's it's pretty, and it's even for this, a shrubby plant, it's pretty stout, thick branch. It's not fine and twiggy like on a lot of other plants. So pretty distinct. Now I cut this one on this part that was going more upright. It's young growth from this year, didn't have flowers on it, and there you can see it's got that big uh, terminal bud. 
I mentioned with Buckeyes, a lot of times the, the, those buds, those turning buds are sticky. They have a resin on them. Uh, with our bottle brush Buckeye, they're not sticky like that. So I just wanted to show you some of the different forms. And this is one you may be more likely to see because uh, it is a, a native plant, I guess, to the southeast. What does the fruit of this look like? Um, the fruit on this plant, do we have any? I don't see any. A couple old ones. It's on, on bottle brush buckeye, it's, it's, um, there's a, about this big, there's a husk and when you open it up, it's got the buckeye. You know, the buckeye. They're small on this compared to, um, you know, like Estulus hippocastinum, the, the horse chestnut that's so big. Those are, you know, much larger. Uh, but, but otherwise similar, they're, um, you know, maybe a, Three quarters of an inch across, inch across, but you know, glossy chestnut brown with the light eye. Other questions, thoughts? So this is a, um, I guess, short tree, or is it a large shrub? Like, large shrub. Large I mean, you, I have seen them trimmed up to be trees, but it doesn't want to be a tree. And you can see it's kind of stoloniferous; it, it spreads out. We've done a lot of cutting on this, and kind of thinned it out and opened it up. I mean, this was just a thicket of, of um, leaves. Is it better in, in moist? It grows naturally in moist soils, yeah. stream edges, things like that. Although it is very tough, it'll grow in, in pretty dry conditions. I do want to, yeah. since we're talking about buds, I do want to illustrate it. Plants with compound leaves, like say this, or a leaf like this, People often get confused and say, talk about this being the leaf, and I say, no, this whole thing is the leaf, or this whole thing is the leaf. I've said this before, I'll see if who's been listening, can somebody tell me the difference between a leaf and a leaflet? Anybody know? Have to do you don't the care. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to do with a petiole because you can get these that are, you know, a leaflet like this, that's branch. The difference is, at the base of a leaflet, it's just more leaf. At the base of a leaf, there is a bud. So there are palms that have leaves, fronds, that are tens of feet long, 20, 30 feet long. But the difference is at the base of a leaf, you have a bud. Palms are a little, little different there. But, um, but so that's what the difference is. So. Um, that's why you have a bud at the top of all those leaf scars, but you wouldn't have buds up here. So, that's the difference between a leaf and a leaflet. Since we were looking at buds, I felt like a good place to throw that in. You can look at that if you want. All right, we're going to turn right around and look at this plant here. And we are so lucky because JC <laughs> loved Prunus mume. And so we have Prunus mume planted around Raleigh, outside of uh, Japan and maybe some spots in California where there's a large Japanese population. We probably have more uh, Prunus uh, mume uh, per capita than, than anywhere else on earth, which is a very lucky thing for us. Um, Prunus mume is uh, a Japanese flowering apricot. Uh, this is one of the few plants I'm gonna talk about at the species level instead of just prunus, although some of what I say will be is, is applicable to, to um, uh, prunus in general. Prunus mume uh, it, it flowers during the winter, for those of you who don't know it, flowers between now and uh, say mid-February, depending on the selection. Uh, this one, Luke, was named here locally by Tom Kranitsky, who breeds some um, prunus mume. Uh, some that we have in almost full flower now are Trumpet and Matsubara Red, which are very early. This one's a little bit later season, but you can see it's showing some, some color in some of the flower buds. Um, so if you see a tree, it's got kind of this rough prunus-like bark down at the base. All prunus have these opposite leaves. And it's got these glossy kind of chestnut brown um, pointed buds, you'll know you probably have a, some sort of prunus or something in the rose family. But if the 
last year's growth is a really nice bright olive green, you'll know that it's Prunus mumex. That's one of the real key features of the plant, those green stems. Green stems, chestnut pointed scaly buds, and then when you go past the green stems, uh, the, the bark from the previous year is this really nice kind of um, uh, striated, striped um, um, bark. Then it goes back to darker, and, and then it gets really rough and kind of warty and scaly. All beautiful. Um, and then if it flowers in the middle of winter, you know for sure you got to produce one. We, we get a lot of questions about, there's a tree flowering in front of the hospital. It's, it's pink flowers right now. What's wrong with it and what is it? And so they had to explain that it's doing what it's supposed to do and uh, it's a prunus moon day. What month does it? The earliest ones start now, but generally I think of them really hitting their, their stride mid to late January. That's that's really the key and they're very the flowers are very very tough you can they can freeze you can snow on them um, i bet in our database we probably have i don't know dozens of pictures of prunus mume flowers with snow on it because every time it snows you go out and you take pictures of the things that are in flower with snow and the snow melts and they go on about their business sometimes you'll some of the flowers will freeze if it gets really cold but it produces it doesn't put them all out right at once it, they kind of come out over open up over succession so you get you always get some flowers even if some are damaged. What what size are the flowers like diameter? Oh uh, they range from maybe a little larger than a half an inch up to about an, an inch. And they're, if you're not familiar with the plant they're wonderfully fragrant uh, real nice kind of clovey um, smell really warm smell it's great for for winter time it's um, you know it's it's a it's kind of a warm uh, 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 I don't know, cloves, is that right? Clove yeah. smell. I can actually smell this one. So. <laughs> and, like and then you'll have apricots on the ground. And then you'll have apricots on the ground, yes. It does form fruit. Uh, they're like little tiny peaches or little apricots. Um, they're not very showy. You can pickle them and eat them. Um, that's, uh, they're, they're eaten very widely in, in China and Japan. And uh, we have people here who come out and furtively collect them and they stop when they see somebody. I always try and assure them they, they're picking them up off the ground. They're not good, I guess, until they drop. That's kind of the, the thing. And we always assure them, please take all you want, take all you want, because we'll get seedlings and we don't want the seedlings. So. It's one of the few things we encourage people to take from the Arboretum. Other questions or thoughts? Okay, we're going to go right here to this plant because it's right up next to the, the bed so it's an easy one to, to look at for everybody um, and talk about maples. And there are a lot of different types of maples. There are great big maples and little maples and everything in between. So how do you identify a maple? Well, mad buck, they have opposite leaves. That's the first thing you look for. Um, and you can see opposite leaves uh, uh, on all here. All these buds are opposite each other. Um, other than that, it can be difficult without leaves to distinguish one from another. Um, even some that are very similar, like our red maple and sugar maple, which have overlapping ranges, uh, the buds are very different. Sugar maple has great big fat buds and, and um, red maple has much smaller rounded buds. Uh, in general, um, you will often get a pair of buds at the tip. Um, some plants, like the buckeye, which has, uh, has opposite um, leaves, it has that one single one at the tip and then two on the side, whereas a maple will typically have two on the side, although some of them are different. The Norway maple will often have a, a, uh, a single one. But they will have opposite branching, so that's always a good way to tell. Many maples, not all, but many maples, especially Japanese maples, will have like a little fringe of, of hair almost around the bud. Um, so, so that can help ID it. Young branches on, on maples are, are almost always nice and smooth for a year or two back. They'll have uh, nice smooth bark and then they can get a, a little bit um, 
a little bit rougher as they get older. Japanese maples tend to hold that smoothness on back for a few years, um, but not, not always. Sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll have fruits on there. The maple um, Samaras are pretty distinctive. We can look at those on another tree, but I did want to point this out. And we'll look at another maple to kind of compare and contrast a little bit. Questions about that? I think it's pretty easy to get down to maple, but sometimes with the maples it can be difficult to distinguish them. But we'll look at a couple so, so you, you get a sense of some of the, the variation. Okay, and just, um, you know, I was talking about the, the boxwood, so I want to show you Ilex Cronata, the Japanese holly, uh, which you see right here, which people often confuse with boxwoods. They're nice, tight, dense um, uh, Japanese hollies that, that resemble boxwoods quite a bit. Um, but like I said, hollies are always alternate leaves. Now with this, where you have these really small uh, spaces between the, um, the leaves, it can be hard to tell for sure, but if you get in there and look closely, you can see, yep, they are alternate. They, they um, are not opposite each other. You'll also, with Japanese hollies, you'll get a little bit of a serration around the edge of the leaf, which, which helps you. The, the new growth isn't, it typically isn't that green you get on the, the boxwoods, but often kind of a, a light kind of purpley mottled uh, uh, kind of color. So y'all can break this off. Y'all can, if you want to look at that. And, and really I'm just, I don't want to spend time on the evergreens. We talk about evergreens at different times, but just wanted to talk about that because in winter I, I invariably get the questions about boxwoods and, and hollies. So if you can see that, that alternate uh, arrangement. <laughs> All right, again, just to, to emphasize some of what I've already, already talked about, this is another linden. This is probably not one that you will find uh, at, at your, your local garden center, uh, Tilia oliveri. Um, but you see those rounded buds, alternate with kind of that zigzag stem. Um, that, that's real key, and those, those rounded, real glossy buds uh, that, that kind of diverge out from the stem. Real distinctive. So even if you have no idea what the species is, you, you, uh, you know, if you, if you know what you're looking at, uh, you can you can pretty easily identify this as at least a linden, a tilia. So I just wanted to. Did that have the three on top like the other one did? The three buds? No, that was a uh, ash. That was oh, fraxinus. Oh, these are fat buds. That's right. See, this is why I didn't do a list because I was stop. I'm, I'm actually stopping at different plants than I did when I kind of kind of eyeball where I, where we'd walk. So, um, but we'll look at an ash with great big fat buds. One of our, our major collections here, uh, we have a national collection of Cirsus or red bud. Um, this is a dwarf form, but it's the uh, same thing um, that you uh, that you get um, somewhere else. Uh, you know, they're Asian ones. I'm sorry that you can look at. One of the things, and I kind of pointed this out with that with the lindens, is that zigzag stem. Um, that's uh, to me, a real key ID feature for uh, for red buds. Um, now, one of, at least one of the ones I passed around, the, the more branched one, you can see the flower buds on there. It's a little harder on this, but that's one thing you look for in a, when you have a mature plant. These little scaly um, buds that are flower buds that are a little bit larger. Uh, those will, those will, are where the flowers will come out. Otherwise, the buds are tiny, tiny, tiny right above the, um, the leaf scars. And the leaf scar is part of what makes it so zigzag. The leaf scar kind of sticks out a little bit. So you have that branch and the leaf scars kind of um, bumps out a little bit, makes it look even more zigzag. Um, the, uh, the bark on it, uh, I'm, it's probably because I've looked at them way too many times. It's kind of distinct to me, although when I'm looking at it, trying to describe it, it looks pretty, uh, Pretty normal, but it's it's kind of a, a it's not smooth like like you get with some, but um, if, especially if you rub your fingers on it, it's got a little bit of texture, uh, but it's kind of a gray brown with little white dots all through it. Um, very very small lenticels, those little white dots. What are they called? Lenticels. And if you look at a plant, you'll often get this kind of open outspread habit. This is a dwarf one. Um, a lot of them you get a little bit more of an arching to it. See that one um, down there still has leaves on it, but still kind of that same kind of a shape. Uh, when they get much older, you'll get, um, you can get a really nice scaly uh, kind of blocky bark 
And uh, let's see, this was probably a bad one to pick because the flower buds are so small on it. But on here, you can see these little clusters of flower buds. An interesting thing with this that you don't see on many trees outside of the, the tropics and subtropics is the flower buds will continue to form even all the way down onto big uh, old stems. Like you have uh, six, eight inch stems and you have uh, flower buds that form on there and flower along the stem. So if you ever see that and you're, you're up here in the temperate, there, I can't think of, I'm trying to think of any other temperate plants. I'm sure there are some, but I can't think of any besides red buds that will flower back on that really old growth. But that zigzag stem and those little scaly stalked flower buds are the, um, the best ID. We're gonna, we're gonna look at a couple to re-emphasize. Here's another maple. Okay. You see a much different looking plant than the Japanese maple we looked at. Um, this one has, you know, two buds, but they're kind of scaly um, buds on the end. You have the opposite uh, uh, leaves on there. Um, not a whole lot similar between the two. Do we have any fruit? No fruit on here. So that, that opposite, um, the opposite leaf arrangement on there is gonna be your biggest clue that it might be a, a, a maple. Some of these can be tough. Another, this is, uh, this is not our native uh, platanus, but we do have um, sycamore platanus uh, that grows native here. Um, and it's another one that's fairly easy to identify. Uh, does this very odd thing the newest the youngest growth the terminals will be kind of narrow and then it'll flare out and have a big fat bud at the end um, the other buds again kind of jut out and they're rounded to slightly pointed a little bit green which is a nice ID feature now the interesting thing about this is very hard to see the bud scar on here um, and that's because the leaf actually if you have leaves on here actually covers the bud so if you pull off the leaves late in the season, you can see the bud underneath there. It's um, kind of a little hollow in the, uh, the leaf, which is great. It really protects um, the buds for the coming year. The, the current season's growth is really nice um, brown, often with a waxy layer. Uh, you can see that kind of on one side is brown, and the other side I have more of this waxy layer um, to it. Sometimes you'll get that waxiness, sometimes you won't. Um, but there's always kind of a, a real distinct change between this season's growth and, and last season's growth. It, it really changed color quite um, quickly. But those, those buds that have been covered by the leaf, um, so the leaf scar actually circles around. And if you look carefully at the leaf scar, you can see the little vascular bundles all the way around the, the bud. And then, of course, if you have a whole plant, that great white bark is pretty easy uh, ID characteristic. I mentioned boxwoods and Japanese hollies, how people get them confused. They also get just your typical um, American holly, Chinese holly, all just, you know, what people think of as holly when they decorate, you know, with, with holly branches, which is actually usually English holly. Um, they get that and a lot of the osmanthus confused because the osmanthus have these holly-like leaves with the spines on there. But osmanthus or tea olive, um, false holly is opposite. And when I was learning these, I always thought, okay, I know that osmanthus and, and hollies have a different leaf arrangement, and I know that boxwoods and holly have a different leaf arrangement. So I always think osmanthus opposite, and then I could take that and say, okay, that means hollies are alternate, and that means boxwoods are opposite. So all from the, the osmanthus, which is one more reason everybody should grow osmanthus. One of many. Um, but but if you get this holly-like leaf and they're opposite, it's osmanthus. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. If you want to know more ID characteristics, um, it's uh, got nice smooth gray bark, um, uh, which always looks nice against the, the leaves. Um, the buds on most osmanthus are kind of pointy, at least osmanthus heterophyllus, and green. Um, always seem to be green. Uh, the tip, it'll usually have two buds, won't have a, a single one at the tip, which is why when it, it grows, you get this nice um, branch arrangement like this. Um, and uh, 
Often with your osmanthus, if it's heterophyllous, which means different leaves, you'll get, you can have both spiny leaves, which is more the juvenile, and these more um, entire without spine, which is more the, the, um, uh, the more um, adult foliage, if you will. Um, I've seen osmanthus heterophyllous grown up as small trees where it's been limbed up and it's got this beautiful domed head uh, where there was not a single spine on the leaf just because it had it was older and had, had uh, moved beyond that or was all spent. Kind of gave, gave uh, you could really see the false uh, uh, or holly, a tea olive uh, character. It looked kind of like a, an olive um, tree, that kind of dusty deep green um, foliage. looked like a you see where you have Holly's growing. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that that is it. We're going to walk back in and point out a few other um, uh, plants that we talked about, just so you can see some variation. Um, you know, the ash where we have a great big huge buds, um, some other maples, that kind of thing. So everybody's welcome to continue on. Love to have you do those. But if you if I have completely worn you out with uh, the uh, we can stop. Yeah, you can see some. Uh, some mumes over there starting that that uh that pink the over there and the white right there. there not the red back there but i think white starting to bloom um i mentioned and uh, we talked about circus before that. um you can see kind of the zigzag stem and these clusters of uh, flower buds um these are a little bit larger so you can see them a little bit better the scales on the flower buds tend to be a little bit divergent on this one some of them they're more closely oppressed so they don't look uh kind of <laughs> so rough on there but you still have those zigzag stems the lentils this is an asian one as opposed to our our native uh this is a fruitless one if you, often you'll find uh, little fruits on red buds which look like bean pods because it is in the bean family so just to show you a little variation on uh, the surs is what they look like so if those pots don't fall off usually they do yeah. mine have been hanging on for the last two years is that a problem yeah. with the tree you know no they they really can hang on for a long time okay. it's not it's not atypical for them to do that flowering right now isn't typical but that really again early on in the season we had some some really nice cold uh, uh temperatures for for a, almost two weeks, you know, down in the, the 40s. And the plants like this that are early season bloomers and the mumes, they got enough chilling. They got all the chilling they needed. So, <laughs> so once it got warm, they, they're, they're a little confused. They're thinking maybe it's uh, springtime. So they're, they're, they're thinking about coming out. They're dipping their toe in the water. Hopefully this weekend did enough to keep them from coming out much farther than this. Again, a, a liriodendron. This is a Chinese liriodendron, um, or tulip tree, tulip poplar, yellow poplar. Uh, this is the Chinese form, but again, you've got those large um, terminal buds uh, that have the, just the two scales covering them. Same kind of fruits, these, the little seeds that I will assume cardinals will eat yes. the, the Asian one also. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know, I'll have with, to uh, watch. Kind of that long, um, centerpiece sometimes sometimes on the trees you'll just have these hanging on them the um the big uh, uh rounded bud scales and, and the line that goes all the way around the the branch there where you have the bud scales um but um very similar to our native uh tulip poplar kind of the smooth bark with those kind of large lentils in there okay i mentioned we saw looked at that smaller ash um over there, we're, we're gonna look at one. This is another flowering ash, but one that's got a little bit stouter branches, um, bigger buds. If you remember how how small those three-part buds were, um, you see these are, are big. And if you look at it carefully, it looks almost like one bud. But if you look at it carefully, you can see it's really three buds there. Um, but still, that opposite, uh, the real um, distinct leaf scar, the swelling at the um, the node where the the leaves are. Uh, so it's a, you know, since it doesn't have the scales, it has fewer scales, kind of fuzzy, large scales covering them, um, just a couple or four on the, the terminals that you can see. Different from a maple, which will have more scales on those opposite um, buds. So just to see the, the variation. Which tree did that come from? From the big one, the, the big, big one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So, any questions about ID? Uh, any questions <laughs> about plants? Anything? Any plants that you want me to show you how to ID? You you got your fill, huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> The labels do make it much easier. I thought about pulling the labels down. A lot. <laughs> Did not. Well, thank y'all all for coming out. This uh, next one, I promise, there'll be there'll be uh, you know more excitement. Uh, so come out to hot plants for cold time. That's right. Or maybe less excitement. Thanks for a great tour, Mark. Well, thank you.